one. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, first CSSR webinar of the the winter time. Uh, it, well, I say it's winter. It's melting here in Kitchener, but uh, it's sort of winter. Uh, welcome. Uh, I, I, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilkins of Flam. I'll be your host for the webinar today. I'm an associate professor in sociology and legal studies at the University of Waterloo, and we have uh, Matthew's wonderful book, uh, Prophets of Love, that we're going to talk about in detail today. So all you Leonard Cohen and Apostle Paul fans are, are in for a treat. Uh, before we get to uh, Michael's book, I just want to, to do the, la the territorial land acknowledgement. So uh, here at the University of Warloo and Wilfrid Laurier University, um, they're where I'm based, uh, the, both universities are situated on the Haldeman Tract. So that's land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and is within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And so, uh, you know, I'd like you to consider where you are, are based and your territory and, and the kind of past and, and history and current contemporary lives that, that are, take place on that land. And uh, yeah, so welcome. So Matthew Anderson, author of, of, of today's uh, book that we're going to have a look at um, and hear about. So usual, Matthew will present for about half an hour. And then we'll have a Q&A for anyone who has questions or comments and, and to launch the discussion. Uh, so Matthew is an affiliate professor in theological studies at the University of Concordia or Concordia University. There we go. Um, and uh, but curr currently not in Montreal in the in the wonderful rural areas <laughs> outside of the city. And so, uh, yeah, Matt, I'll, uh, thanks for being here and I'll pass the mic over to you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And I would, I am going to share a screen, but maybe while I'm doing that, I will say, or before I do that, I'll say that uh, I'm speaking to you from Mi'kma'ki. Um, we, uh, the closest First Nation here is, um, it's called Bugnageg, uh, Bugnageg First Nation. And it's actually just across uh, an inlet in a bay, sort of from uh, where we are, uh, where I'm sitting right now. And I'm speaking from Pumpkit, which is uh, an Acadian sort of a settlement outside of Anaganish. So a village outside of a very uh, outside of a small town, and uh, in Nova Scotia, um, and I think that's it. Um, so is that all right, Sarah? Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. So um, uh, I was very very pleased. I'm very very pleased to uh, to uh, be able to share something about the book, just because it's so much fun. Um, and it brings uh, scholarship and uh, music and um, and deeper thinking uh, about uh, religion and about the um, about all kinds of things. And so uh, I love to uh, I thought I'd hold that up and um, and I'd say my gratitude to CSSR for hosting this webinar and to the folks who are here to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for um, who well not only who is hosting this but who is the series editor. Um, for the uh, for the series in which the book takes place, um, um, hold on, wait. Oh, look at that! I can't do that. Uh, for including prophets of love in the in the uh, series, and um, I'd like to thank also Kyla Madden, who is the editor at uh, at um, McGill Queen's University Press, who. Uh, who um, took on the um, took on the book in the first place, and to the reviewers, and also the um, the uh, copy editor, uh, the reviewers and the copy editor who improved the uh, manuscript a great deal. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank the University Research Committee of Concordia University because I was uh, fortunate to apply for and receive a grant from Concordia to uh, to help with publication, and that's in part related to the fact that. Um, the Concordia University Part-Time Faculty Association, which is a wonderful part-time union, um, provided research has provided research funding for years and years for for people like me, and um, and uh, in this particular case, they provided a grant to pay for the indexing, and then finally to Shirk uh, for the awards to scholarly publications grant, which also helped with the uh, uh, with the book. Um, I just want to underline that Kufa is just an incredible uh, part-time association, and uh, it is uh, it's uh, it's been a joy to work with them and to be supported in my research and my uh, work, and then now in the publication also by them. So the format I thought for the first uh, thirty minutes uh, would be that I would say why the book, three reasons why the book. Uh, number two, I talk about what's in the book, and number three, I talk about what I've learned after writing this book. Um, so in other words. Uh, 
we're going to kind of talk around the thing a little bit, I hope. Um, if you know um, Montreal at all, this street where the picture has been taken is, um, it's not Bishop and it's not Mackay, it's the next one over, it's Crescent. Um, Crescent Street at the top of Crescent Street near Sherbrooke, looking down, uh, and there should be uh, Boustin, um, Boustin uh, uh, Schwarma is right down there toward Leonard Cohen on the right-hand side, a favorite of Concordia students and a great place to have uh, a little bit of food if you're there. So format of the webinar is that. And I, I have to kind of figure out how to, you would think I would know how to do this. It's clear this has been a while since I've done online teaching. I'm trying to figure out, how, oh, there we are, okay. Um, so why the book? The first thing is the positionality, why the book? This picture, I don't know if you, I did not doctor this picture. Um, this picture, which I hope you can see, is uh, a picture that I took in 2022, in May 2022, after uh, every, I taught an evening class. I taught two classes during the summer school in uh, summer of May 2022. And uh, this was on the fifth floor of the hall building at Concordia. And uh, it was, uh, every time I would finish teaching the class, it was a Paul class, every time I'd finish teaching the class, I would look up and there, that's what I'd see, especially during the so-called golden hour, when the sun is sort of shining uh, onto the buildings nearby and then in, literally Leonard filled that window. And um, it was the most amazing coincidence that I was uh, pitching this book to McGill Queens at the time and waiting to hear back about what they, what Kyla Madden and others thought about it. And, uh, and every evening uh, at about uh, 8.30, I'd look up and there'd be Leonard with his hand on his chest, looking at me through the window. Um, so positionality, things like that are a part of our positionality. And I think being in Montreal uh, was about a, a part of that as well. Um, uh, we never, ever met. Uh, Leonard and I have never met, but it's one of those a couple degrees of separation kinds of things uh, where um, I certainly know people who knew him and uh, uh, and who met him, and um, um, anyway, he was a he was a famous presence on uh, the main on Saint, uh, Boulevard Saint Laurent, and uh, certainly I've I've been up and down that street for decades as well. And so, being a Montrealer, I was always interested in Leonard Cohen as well, um, hoping to catch a glance of him maybe on the main at the coffee shops, but never never did. Um, Another thing is that I've been a Cohen fan for years. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily the deepest Cohen fan, and there might be folks here who are um, who are more, uh, well, I've become quite a bit uh, more of an in-depth Cohen fan since starting to write this book. But when I started, I appreciated his music. The lyrics would sometimes catch me by surprise, and I, but I didn't really have a, um, uh, I didn't have a, a comprehensive grasp of his, of his uh, creative output. But I was a fan, for sure. Uh, other bits of my positionality, uh, my PhD is about Paul. So that's the Paul piece. There's Paul and, and Leonard, the Montrealer, uh, who is surrounded by Leonard Cohen and knows a, a lot about Leonard Cohen and his music. Uh, also, the Paul piece, my PhD um, was um, from McGill. And it was called, the title of the PhD was Before the Fact, How Paul's Rhetoric Made History. So I've always been interested in, um, in the in the complicated relationship between self-presentation and uh, historical fact, uh, um, uh, between history and what we can do with a rhetorical document. Um, and then finally, uh, Paul within Judaism has certainly been a part of my um, formation in Paul for many, many years. Um, I, I, way back in the 1980s, which says something about how old I am, um, in the sort of mid 1980s, I uh, met, uh, I didn't meet Christopher Stendhal, but I met his book and especially the um, the chapter, uh, Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the West, which was really a mind blower for me and a turning point in my thinking about Paul. Um, and um, I, I don't know how well known that chapter is, but uh, Christopher Stendhal uh, was, um, was one of the formative influences, for instance, on, uh, um, on, on many other people, um, Paul Fredrickson and others. And, um, and I think that that whole idea of, of Paul within Judaism has really been something that I've, I've learned uh, over the decades. 
And I've learned also from a lot of uh, younger, mostly Jewish and women colleagues, uh, not not only, but some I've 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 learned at the feet of a lot of uh, of my colleagues about Paul, and um, and Paul within Judaism um, is not one thing. It's a wide field. It, there's a variety of viewpoints within it, but I've certainly come to appreciate and to espouse the views of Paul within Judaism. Uh, so that's why the position uh, the positionality of the book. Uh, why the book purpose? Uh, why did I write the book? Um, here I'm going to quote. Um, an indigenous author, Margaret Kovach, who's pictured here on the left. And she is, um, uh, she's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, Treaty 6 territory. And um, one of the things that indigenous authors have reminded us is that um, uh, at its best indigenous knowledge is what are you bringing back for the community? That is uh, when you do something, for instance, if, uh, if uh, when you research something, it's what are you bringing back? What is the benefit that's coming back for the community from your work? It's not so much about uh, about personal, but it's about what are you bringing back for the community? And so here are some of the things that I hope this book um, might aid with. And one is to fight banal, often unconscious Christian supersessionism centered on Paul. Um, I know of which I speak, uh, being a Lutheran, uh, in background, um, Lutherans uh, have a have had historically a very specific um, framework for understanding Paul, which is mediated through Luther, uh, through the Reformation and through uh, early modern Europe. Um, and uh, there are a lot of things about uh, there are a lot of well-meaning uh, Christians who um, would never consciously uh, embrace supersessionism, but sort of. Uh, unconsciously and in uh, structural ways do it all the time from pulpits and uh, and other ways and so this book I hoped was some uh, went a small way toward um, combating that uh, another thing I'd like to do uh, with this book I wanted to do with this book was to speak truth about flaws um, I did not want to avoid the misogyny of Leonard Cohen um, even though I admire many things about Leonard Cohen uh, his relations with women were problematic at best and as somebody one time said to me, he, I mean, the only way that he escaped scandal was partly by dying. Um, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was old. Uh, he got old and, and sort of departed the scene um, before uh, the sort of inevitable things could come up about most of, I mean, people knew about many of the things, but uh, his relations were just problematic. Uh, he, he was, uh, he used his, Power, especially the earlier Cohen, uh, used his status um, in ways that are simply unacceptable. And we're I, in the book. I talk about that, and I try not to shy away from uh, the way that he treated women as objects and as muses, without actually treating them as people. Very often, um, to rehabilitate Paul was the third reason that I tried to uh, write the book, and um, that was primarily from the charges of misogyny that Paul sometimes faces still. Uh, especially when people uh, equate Paul with the pastoral letters, uh, second Tim uh, first and second Timothy and Titus and so on. Um, I'll talk more about that, I think, later. Number four, uh, purpose of the book, what to bring back to the community to show the depth of religious learning and carefully multivalent religious illusion in Leonard's poetry. Uh, Leonard uh, loved uh, piling meanings on to, um, to, a, to a phrase. And um, you can just see it. Once you start, somebody should write a commentary. Probably somebody has. But I kept thinking there needs to be a commentary on, uh, I was just listening today to uh, Popular Problems, uh, his 2012 uh, album. And I thought, you know, you could write a commentary just on the scriptural, um, and by scriptural, I mean scriptural in a wide sense, um, allusions in that, in that album, in that set of, uh, set of poems, of, of lyrics. So uh, I wanted to show some of that, at least, in, in the book, and then to show the often missed beauty in many of Paul's lines by setting them side by side without chapter and verse. One of the things that I did in the book was to um, put Paul there without, uh, without chapter and verse, so that you would start to read it a little bit like you read um, Leonard's lyrics. So another reason um, why the book, and that is, I'm just trying to move this thing over. Can't do it. Uh, hold on. There we are. Um, genre. 
Setting dissimilar things beside each other often shifts our perspective, helping us to see what we think we know more clearly. So it's not a game, although it is playful. So the book is playful, I hope, in setting these two beside each other. Um, but it's a hermeneutical exercise, learning to see Leonard as a scriptural writer, which I think in his last years he wanted, he he uh, um, aspired to. Uh, a self-proclaimed prophet and ascetic and eschatological figure steeped in Jewish and Christian and Buddhist and Sufi, by the way, I forgot to put that in their writings, amongst others. Um, learning to see Paul as a poet and as a mystic and as a conflicted figure who relied heavily on his women patrons and manipulated his message as well, rhetorically and emotionally. So I wanted to flip them up and by seeing uh, each of them through the lens of the other, I, I hoped would uh, show, uh, shed some new light on both. So this is just a quote. Imagine Leonard Cohen and Paul as brothers with wildly different characters, but a strong family resemblance. Uh, Paul, the eldest brother, was awkward, abrasive, and zealous. Leonard, the successful, smooth-talking, romantic younger brother, was prone to addiction and depression. Paul died a martyr, not knowing his words would have any effect on the world, while Leonard could see his canonization within his lifetime. By the way, great to see your cat, MJ. And, and uh and uh, ours is right behind me somewhere. It looks very similar and might show up at some point as well. Um, so what's inside the book? Um, I wanted to give you a look at the table of contents just because I think it, it shows sort of what the book's about. Um, chapter one, almost like the blues. Thoughts with my feet up on Leonard Cohen's coffee table. Uh, that's a story that I hope I have some time to tell, um, but it's behind me here. Um, let us compare mythologies, Leonard and Paul within Judaism. So that idea, again, of within Judaism. Um, and the title of, of uh, Leonard's first book of poetry in 1956 is called Let Us Compare Mythologies, which I think there's uh, an on, uh, basing my work on uh, Harry Friedman's uh, book, I believe that there is a uh, an ongoing um, theme throughout uh, Cohen's corpus of comparing Judaism and Christianity even though he didn't restrict himself to those two. Chapter three, Lonely Wooden Tower, Leonard and Paul's preoccupation with Jesus, of course, from the song Suzanne. Um, now, chapter four, Death of a Ladies' Man, Leonard, Paul, and Women. So this uh, Leonard, Paul, misogyny, view of women, a role of women in their lives and in their writing. Uh, chapter five, Traveling Light, Leonard and Paul as ascetics. Chapter six, I'm Your Man. Uh, could you pick a different title for that chapter, never, Leonard and Paul's masculinity, performed masculinity. And they each performed uh, alternative masculinity, uh, but they didn't always do it successfully. Um, chapter seven, everybody knows uh, Leonard and Paul's beguiling rhetoric. Chapter eight, birds on a wire, how Leonard and Paul had no choice. And uh, the prophetic compulsion is essentially that chapter. Chapter nine, the secret chord, Leonard and Paul, the mystics. Chapter 10, Come Healing as Witnesses to Brokenness and Redemption. Uh, for Paul scholars, the theology of the cross might fit in this chapter. And uh, in terms of Cohen, it's the famous quote about uh, uh, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Um, and then um, chapter 11, Thanks for the Dance. And this gave me a chance to talk about uh, reception history, essentially. They're long afterlives. And I wanted to point out on the other side of the slide that I could have used other titles, uh, Leonard and Paul within Judaism, I could have used Born in Chains, Going Home from Old Ideas, uh, The Preoccupation with Jesus, I could have used Show Me the Place, uh, which is a fantastic song I just heard, or the 1956 poem for Wilfred in his house, Prophetic Compulsion, I could have used Almost Like the Blues, um, or Treaty, or You Want It Darker, frankly, you could go on and on for Cohen, uh, titles about Prophetic Compulsion. Um, chapter 11, Reception History, You Got Me Singing, which I was listening to just before uh, we started this web uh, webinar. So three surprises uh, in writing the book. Uh, Leonard was more Christian than Paul. Notice I put the uh, word Christian entre guillemets, as we say in Quebec, uh, in quotation marks. Leonard was not a Christian. I'm not trying to say he was a Christian, but he was more Christian, Christian influenced than Paul. Leonard was more Christian than Paul. Paul was more of an accidental, I put that again in brackets just to, to frame it. Paul was more of a feminist than Leonard. You know, feminist again is entre guillemets or in quotation marks because I don't think that either Leonard or Paul were feminists in the contemporary sense of that term. Paul certainly was not a feminist in a contemporary sense, but as a, as a point of disputation, Paul was 
um, had a had a more holistic place for women as people, which is the definition of feminism. A woman is a person. Um, uh, than Leonard did. The, did. Uh, both were Jews obsessed with Jesus. Both relied heavily on their women patrons. Both cultivated a rhetorical persona and both performed an alternative masculinity that wasn't that alternative in the end. Um, so those were surprises for me or things that came out that I think might be surprising for readers as well. Uh, something I wish I could have emphasized even more. Um, I would have loved to have talked a little bit more in the book about the eschatological commonalities between these two, because eschatology is a theme in Cohen that's pretty much ignored uh, by fans and in the Cohen scholarship that I've read, and I've read a bit of it, a fair bit of it. Um, there is a kind of an eschat, you know, when you're a Paul scholar attuned to eschatological themes from uh, Paul's letters, uh, it's kind of surprising when you start to see some of the same stuff in Cohen. Um, I love the song, The Faith, uh, from Dear Heather, which otherwise I don't particularly like the album, Dear Heather, but uh, The Faith is a wonderful song, uh, 2004. And he's got this, firstly, you see a cross in every hill, a star, a minaret. So you get the the uh, the interfaith uh, references there. Uh, so many graves to fill, oh love, aren't you tired yet? The sea so deep and blind where still the sun must set and time itself unwind. That is an eschatological line, if ever there was. Oh, love, aren't you tired yet? And he's addressing God. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. That's the kind of thing I did in the book. You put Paul right in there beside Leonard and then see uh, what, the, what the flow feels like going from one to the other. Um, um, beside the shepherd in 1956, right at the very outset, um, if you are a Cohen fan and you want to sort of see uh, some of the things that he almost marks in his poetry as directions for his life, this book is amazing to read. It's called Let Us Compare Mythologies, 1956. I think you can get it on Bookfinder. And it's got some poetry in there, which is astounding for how it predicts some things that would later happen in his life. But he, here it's eschatological. Beside the shepherd dreams the beast of laying down with lions. It's a, an Isaiah quote. Naked running through the mansion, the boy with news of the Messiah forgets the message for his father, enjoying the marble against his feet. Cohen was a messenger who forgot often about the message, but enjoyed the marble against his feet and always fought against that, um, the sensuality um, of life. Um, and then Boogie Street, which is a great, uh, a wonderful song as well, uh, where he says, so come, my friends, be not afraid. We are so lightly here. It is in love that we are made, in love we disappear. Though all the maps of blood and flesh are posted on the door, think about those uh, references, there's no one who has told us yet what Boogie Street is for. Sort of uh, uh, a reference to life, uh, but also to, to the race. Disclaimer, um, just watching my time here. Um, the wonderful thing about about Cohen is that his lyrics are so uh, multivalent, which means they point in so many directions at once intentionally. Um, but that's also the frustrating thing. Joan Baez said about Bob Dylan, you were always so good with words and with keeping things vague. And uh, Cohen uh, learned a lot from Bob Dylan. I actually think that Cohen's earlier stuff, his he tries to make his voice Dylan-esque. And I like it when he doesn't. Like if you listen to Bird on a Wire or, uh, or Suzanne, He's doing this kind of nasal thing with his with his voice, which sounds very Bob Dylan. And I think he admired Dylan, and that was maybe why he did it. But uh, in his later albums, he just has that rough old man voice, and I think it's much better myself. Um, I took this photo outside of uh, of Cohen's house uh, on Rue Valliere, just out, uh, off of uh, Boulevard Saint Laurent. And um, it was a place of pilgrimage already, by the way. When, when I went there and took this picture, there were three or four people um, and I talked to them and a couple were from Poland and there were some people from, uh, a couple from Poland, some people from Scotland or England and somebody else from, um, I think they were Chinese. Um, I didn't talk so much to them, but I, I think they were, I think they were Chinese and they were, um, they were pilgrims. They were all there to take a look at, at Cohen's house. And I thought, wow, um, I think he'd like that. <laughs> 
Um, so there you are. Uh, reader response. I, if I get a moment, I'll, I'll just say something about the novel, this novel writing group I was in, but I think I'll press on for now. So some things I've learned uh, since publication. Um, more than many of us may have realized, Leonard in the end at least saw, in the end at least, saw himself like Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. Um, I, I, this has come, become clear to me since publishing the book in some ways. Um, I, it's the God of Israel. Uh, it was never any question that it's the God of Israel for Leonard Cohen. And um, uh, uh, one of the learnings of the Paul within Judaism um, uh, movement or trend within uh, Pauline scholarship is that once you once you take Paul out of canon, and you know, depend, what, it always depends on what you're comparing to. If you compare Paul's letters to the canon of of Second Second Temple Judaism, um, they they take on different meanings than they do if you compare them to the canon of the New Testament as it developed and formed, and then was received by the early church and then the medieval and later church. Um, and it's interesting to me reading the lyrics, uh, reading Cohen's lyrics more and more. I think that he, in some way, saw himself like Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. I put foreskinned in there because, in in fact, um, in a couple of in at least one place, the um, the Greek is not uncircumcised. It's like Peter should be. Uh, uh, it's in Galatians, I guess. Uh, uh, it was agreed that. Um, uh, Peter should go to the circumcised and I to the uncircumcised. It's actually the foreskinned, um, but the translators into English have translated it as uncircumcised, uh, perhaps for reasons of matching or perhaps for uh, uh, prudence or something. I'm not sure. Um, uh, Leonard saw himself perhaps as a provocateur of the divine response, um, especially in his last album, which was issued only, uh, uh, what, 15 or 18 days before his death. Um, I think he saw himself in some ways as challenging the divine. Um, and if we have a chance in the Q&A, maybe we can talk about if if Paul challenged the divine in some ways as well. I note here the collection to Jerusalem um, and the, the ending of Romans. I mean, one of the interesting things about Paul is that we don't really know uh, what happened. Uh, we, we get these hints and there's tradition, but we don't know for sure. Uh, musically, I've noticed how the arrangements back up the words very, very nicely in so many ways. Um, it, when he's talking about being chosen and almost like the blues, it's got this kind of um, uh, this rhythm. There's no guitar. It's it's drums and a bass, and it's this driving. It's not driving. I wouldn't say that. It's funky, but it's 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 absolutely a tempo, and uh, and there's no escaping the rhythm. Um, and so that's this idea of of being of being chosen under compulsion of being chosen. Um, but oh, love, aren't you tired yet? With this kind of eschatological um, feel and this line about time itself unwinding. It's interesting that he set that to a waltz beat or to a waltz rhythm. So one, two, three, one, two, three, which is a kind of a, a dance, a play. And um, and I I think he did these things on purpose. I don't think it was by accident. Um, uh, this is not what I wrote the book about, but I appreciate uh, hearing the musicality matching the lines, the lyrics so well. Um, so uh, let me see. Leonard and Paul's A Common Quarrel with God. A bit like Elie Wiesel's Where is God in the Midst of All the Suffering? Praising God During a Time of Injustice. Um, I think that I've learned since publishing the book even more strongly um, about how I think Leonard in his final, especially in his final uh, albums, was um, taking up the quarrel uh, with God. Um, and, uh, and what he, uh, you know, he, this, at the very beginning, when we first were getting together, somebody said sportsman and a shepherd and a lazy bastard living in a suit. Somebody quoted that line and, um, that right there, that line is already showing you that, um, I love to speak with Leonard. That's the, the first line. I love to speak with Leonard. Um, and Leonard is taking on the voice of God, which is part of the definition of prophetic, uh, speech. He's 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 um, you know speaking first person um, about himself through this through this uh, divine mouth, and um, and I just think that there's a there's a quarrel happening there. Cohen knew the apocryphal literature, um, for instance, in Second Maccabees, um, 
a lot of, especially people, uh, Christians, but uh, people influenced by the, the the scholarly worldview of Christianity or the canon, don't necessarily realize uh, that in Second Maccabees you find a pre-Christian uh, Jewish examples of of martyrdom, insurrection, uh, resurrection. Excuse me, might be insurrection as well. Martyrdom, resurrection, expiatory atonement through self-sacrifice. Um, all of these things were have been seen throughout history as Christian um, innovations, uh, but in fact they're there um, uh, in Second Maccabees and elsewhere. But they existed in Judaism. Uh, ancient Judaism prior to uh, prior to Christianity. Um, by the way, this is from I said as we were getting together, I was going to be quoting my my partner, uh, Dr. Sarah Parks, um, who from whom I've learned so much. Uh, she's certainly one of those influences. Um, but uh, her book, together with Shana Scheinfeld and um, and Meredith Warren, and uh, er, Jewish and Christian women in the in the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, oh, sorry. Jewish and Christian Women in the Ancient Mediterranean um, by Rutledge. It's a wonderful textbook, uh, especially chapter four uh, on, on uh, methodologies is fantastic. Um, but also Parks, uh, Sarah has written an article, uh, Women and Gender in the Apocrypha, uh, Oxford Handbook for the Apocrypha. And some of these thoughts come from there. Um, but Leonard Cohen takes issue with the Deuter Deuteronomistic paradigm. Uh, God allows enemies to conquer when covenant is not kept, innocent, willing sacrifice of, in this case, the Maccabean martyrs, uh, is what partly turns God's face back toward the people. And then the Maccabees win back their territory from the Seleucids. So um, this idea of uh, of justice, uh, Cohen talks in, uh, in his, uh, in his um, song, Come Healing, he says, come healing of the altar, come healing of the name. And I think that it's that kind of, um, it's a disputation with God from within for, for Cohen from within Judaism. And I think Paul also was party to that kind of disputation. So final irony, uh, as I close up, Paul's writings were soon scriptural for the early community and eventually canonical, though he had not imagined that long a time frame. Um, he was eschatological. Uh, and so it was next week, next month, next year at the latest, uh, he wouldn't have expected um, the kind of long reception history he had. Leonard pictured his legacy from the outset and near the end of his life wrote lyrics he seems to have hoped would become or be considered in some way scriptural, taking their place within the tradition. And I took this picture, uh, oh, I forget where I was when I took this, at Concordia or in the Musée de Beaux-Arts. And um, I, it made, reminded me of, Le of Leonard's line, you'll be hearing from me, baby, long after I'm gone. I'll be speaking to you sweetly from my window in the Tower of Song. And... Uh, <laughs> probably tongue in cheek, but that's in fact what he's doing. So um, I think that's my 30 minutes and I'll stop there and uh, stop the sharing. Okay, thanks, Matthew. No, that's super, super interesting. I really enjoyed the book, by the way. I didn't get a chance to mention that at the start, but I, it was a really fascinating read. It's really, like you say, it's a completely flipped or different way of seeing these two writers, right? That well, yeah. we're probably all somewhat familiar with a little bit. I'm not a huge Cohen fan, but I've read read some of his poetry and vice versa. <laughs> Same no. with the Apostle Paul. But yeah. really fun to kind of see some of the similarities and some of the key differences and kind of really to look at it in a completely different and, and pretty fun way. It was a very yeah. pleasant read too. Um, okay, so we're, this is the Q&A period has begun, so you can pop your question in the chat. The chat is open. If you just want to raise your virtual hand to ask a question, you're more than welcome to. We have some good amount of time for questions. And I, I kind of was hoping to get us started, uh, Matthew, but kind of one big question I had after reading the book was, wh what do you think is going to be the legacy of, of these two men, right? So do you think Leonard Cohen's body of work is going to be recognized and utilized for many generations only a few generations you know now that kind of you know there's a newer generations are looking at christianity a bit differently and not in the same way as in in the past do you think they're going to kind of revisit the apostle paul's writings or not what, what were your kind of thoughts of like if we look for like the next hundred years where these works will go or if they'll keep going what do you think uh, well, Paul, I mean, I think that the whole um, resituating of Paul within the, the um, Second Temple period um, is, in fact, a way of kind of and and pulling him out of canon, you know, sometimes sometimes kicking and screaming, maybe according to his interpreters, but uh, pulling him out of canon and and understanding him better within his own context is really a part of that uh, change 
that you're talking about for Paul. I mean, Paul has certainly had 2,000 years of, of reception history. Um, but I, one of the ironies of it is that it's maybe, you know, it, it's a little bit like these artists who always say, I, you know, the, I don't know, they write all these books and then they're remembered for some for some little bit thing that they wrote that was two pages long, you know, and they said, well, I wrote all these fantastic novels or whatever it might be. And I'm, I'm remembered for this, for this commercial or something. Well, Paul is being remembered. Maybe Paul is being remembered sometimes not for the things that we should be remembering him for. So I think that's some of what's happening um, in the academic movement now. Uh, Cohen, it's, I mean, it's too early to tell, but I, the, one of the interesting things for me about the book was, thinking about the fact that I think Cohen was writing for posterity and that he was writing to be scriptural in a sort of a broad sense. Um, and some, especially in some of his last stuff, uh, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's backed up in, in many ways, it's gospel music in many ways, uh, musically, but I think that the words too, um, he's taking his place or trying to take his place uh, in that Tower of Song, he's trying to take his place among the Psalms, for instance, and and the laments, and um, and I think that was something that was working in his mind. He was too canny uh, to say that out loud much. I think you know he always wanted a wink and a nod, but I think he was trying to do that. And I don't know. I think maybe some folks who are here will have an opinion about you know will Cohen's work survive? I don't. I don't know. Um, but um, I think he was aiming at it. Anyway. Yeah, you see? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. Brian, do you want to go ahead? Well, the, the fact that Leonard was aiming at it is demonstrated by the fact that he, he never threw away a piece of paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? he, he kept absolutely everything, and it's all been archived in, in various places. And uh, so that, that, that was obviously part of his own self understanding. Um, I, I've read the book, uh, Matthew. Thank you for it. And uh, I guess two, two small things and, and then, then a bigger question. Uh, small thing, just a musical thing. Uh, did you notice that on a, a, almost all of his early albums, he plays the Jews harp? <laughs> you know, I've I've heard it. But yeah. I didn't think about it. I did not it, think about it. It's it, it's there all over the place, which which is you know also part of it. I mean that is not a rock and roll instrument, <laughs> uh, and, and that that's part part of his his uh, self referential sense of humor. Uh, other small thing, uh, you've probably read Marcia Pauli uh, from this Broken Hill I sing to you. Yeah. It's not referenced, but it's specifically on theodicy in in cohen i yeah. think it's fundamentally wrong uh it, it basically wants to say that that cohen's complaint about god is that um uh, god created us in certain ways uh with with our with freedom so that we we keep on messing up and we keep on engaging in, in e evil and violence so it's kind of God's problem that God created us this way, which which I think is is a very facile uh, reading of, of Cohen. Uh, I think there's there, there's something much more profound going on in in Cohen's struggle with evil uh, than that. But here's my question. Here's here's my question. The, the short question is, uh, what what's the theological fruit of 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 your work? You know, you 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 place uh cohen and paul side by side and and see what happens uh and which is stuff that that i've done in a manuscript that is also on cohen that'll be coming out this year oh, and, and and it's in that it's it's great fun to do that uh i guess the question i want to ask is beyond doing the comparison and contrast between these two jewish figures what new meaning or new meanings are born? Or another way to put it very personally is, how has your theology grown through the project? Um, thank you, firstly, for the questions. And I'm looking forward to the book already. Um, I, uh, I'll admit about, uh, about Marcia uh, Pauli's about the, From This Broken Hill. I, I, in my research, I looked at the book and I read through it and I... Um, 
one thing I didn't say uh, in my presentation so much is that I, it became clear to me at some point that I'm not a theologian as much as I am a biblical studies, uh, I'm a bi biblical scholar. And so there is, I mean, it's not that I'm not a theologian, but um, I could have gone into, for instance, uh, the theology of the cross, you know, on in terms of uh, the brokenness, uh, Cohen themes of brokenness and so on. And I just, uh, that's not particularly where I was going with it. So when you ask, uh, what's the the theological fruit, um, I would say that some of the, 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 the I'll just maybe repeat that uh, some of the effects that I was having, the good that I hope might be done in a small way about the book and somebody's reading of it would be that there would be a, a combating of that kind of facile supersessionism that affects so many uh, Christians and people influenced by Christianity. Uh, and again, not not even a conscious one sometimes, but I've, I've heard so many uh, well-meaning um, uh, Christian preachers and so on talk about um, talk about uh, uh, the Old Testament bad, New Testament good. You know this kind of binary. Uh, when in fact, all you have to do is read Revelation to to realize that there's an, a horrific Jesus in the New Testament. Um, I mean, not just in Revelation, but especially in Revelation. Um, and um, and you uh, this kind of binary about uh, I just heard it the other day on something, and it wasn't a church. But it was somebody obviously influenced, a politician, I think, was sort of referring to the fact, well, the law, the law is bad, you know, we, freedom, it was this kind of contrast of freedom and the law. And um, it's just uh, too facile, and it's not accurate to the texts. And so as a, as a biblical studies uh, person and a Paul scholar, um, I wanted to contribute something to um muddying the image of Paul that many people have. Paul, people see Paul as, as a paradigm, especially Christians, see Paul as a paradigm without realizing that um, Paul might not have been all that concerned about them um, in some ways. And so what does it do if you decenter the the Christian at the center of, you know, the, the idea that Paul's message was for me? That's a canonical, that's a response that is conditioned by the canon. Um, and once you decanonize Paul, which you do if you're looking at him historically, um, you uh, you start to see the theology in new ways. And uh, the theology may be a foreign, strange thing to us in some cases that has much more to do with the first century than with the 21st century. Um, you make him strange in some ways. And uh, I think there's a chapter in uh, uh, Matthew Thiessen just came out with a book about Paul, uh, a, a nice little book about Paul. And the first chapter is called Make Paul Weird Again. And I think that that's partly, um, I, I wasn't trying to make him weird, but I was trying to make him different, at least, by comparing him to Cohen in that way. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a book of theology, ultimately, in that sense, quite. Um, I think it does come back to theology by talking about reception history and by brokenness, you know, talking about brokenness. And I agree with you, Cohen is not facile in his treatment of um, theodicy. Um, now, I, I don't necessarily you know, disagree with uh, Pauli's book about that, but I, I do think that that Cohen Cohen doesn't pronounce a, 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 an easy answer on theodicy. Sorry, that was a long answer, um, but anyway, that was. Thank you for the question, and I look forward to the book. Okay, uh, Michael has a question in the chat. Michael, did you want to ask it to over the mic, or would you like me to read it? Oh, I can do that. Uh, thanks, Matthew, for this presentation. Really. Uh, enjoyed it. Thank um, you. Been a been a Cohen fan for a long time, and maybe maybe one of the deeper ones. But as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the song "The Future," which I think is probably one of the darkest songs ever written in Western culture, actually. But uh, wondered if you discussed that in your book, or if you'd want to discuss this little phrase, because I was just thinking as you're talking, I was thinking it's interesting the word "and" here and the word "or" in this little in this little couplet. Um, from the yeah, song, but I'm trying to. Um, no, uh, you know, I mean, most people just go to uh, ring the bells that still can ring, which is itself fine and profound. But um, um, tell me more again about what what it, exactly you said to Andrew the Orr. Can you just tell me exactly which? The little quote is in the chat, but the quote is, okay. "Give me back the Berlin Wall, give me Stalin and Saint Paul, give me Christ or." give me Hiroshima. And, and again, I think Leonard's a, a, a careful enough writer. None of those things are there by accident, right? But anyways, just interested in, in your thoughts on that, or if you talked about that in the book. 
Yeah, um, I talked a little bit about the fact that this is the only um, explicit mention of Paul, I think. And um, he, uh, I find it interesting that uh, that he, well, first um, he lumps him with, you know, he lumps him as a as a despot or a dictator, you know, as a source of evil and suffering. Um, and uh, and I don't think he had. I mean, he he had a a view. I think he participated in um, that view uh, that. You know, Jesus was one of us as a Jew. Jesus is one of us, but Paul, no, that's something else again. And that the idea that Paul created, you know, the the trope that Paul created Christianity, whereas Jesus, you know, it goes back, uh, it goes back to Boltman. Well, it goes before that, but Boltman famously said uh, Jesus talked about the, the realm of God, and Paul talked about Jesus, and um, and sort of contrasted them that way. But one of the learnings of of um, the people who lately who have been doing much much more studying about about Paul is that um, is that Paul uh, once you situate Paul within apocalyptic Judaism of the first century, uh, you may you, a person can start to realize that he, we can't necessarily load all of Christianity on his shoulders. Like I think Cohen, even though he is absolutely careful, and I agree with you. I think Cohen may have participated slightly in that in that assumption of sort of loading Christianity onto Paul's shoulders. I think Paul is standing in for Christianity in that in the in the future in that in those lyrics. So that's kind of my answer to that. And I don't I I hope to trouble that um, and make sure that Paul doesn't sort of bear the weight of all of Christianity's um, issues. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I, as a, a deep Cohen fan. Um, there's just so much. I, I'd love to talk with you someday about show me the place. Um, anyway, but back to you, Sarah, I think. Yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, so other questions? We got lots of time. Um, maybe while other people are gathering their thoughts, you could tell us, Matthew, the story of your writing group. Uh, oh, yeah. Teacher, it, which you've teased in the presentation, but sounds yeah, it, it, it's about the idea of. Um, you have to be careful with Cohen because you can read things into him. And, um, and he, he wanted it that way. I mean, he wrote such that you could uh, do that. <clears throat> and I guess the story was that I was in a writing group uh, with a, a fantastic uh, Montreal writer, Jewish writer. And, um, and he uh, previewed uh, a new novel that he'd come out with. And it was, it was set in South Carolina, Georgia, something like this in the marshes. And a, a sort of a matriarch of a very powerful family takes her uh, eldest son, who was she, with whom she was estranged, out onto a tower overlooking the marshes and all of this land that belongs to the family and says, um, all you have to do is finally listen to me and all this would be will be yours. And, and, and I said to the author in the writing group, I said, wow, that's brilliant appropriation of the temptation story of Jesus. And this author looked at me and went, Oh yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so clearly, he hadn't been thinking about it explicitly, but yet he still uh, was, uh, I think, relying in some ways on that story. But the story had gone in, has gone into the sort of, uh, you know, Western imagination in such a way that he could draw on it without realizing that it was the temptation story about Jesus. Um, and so we have to be careful with Cohen, um, you know, what or Paul. Uh, but Cohen, especially, we have to be careful of attributing everything to him, uh, when in fact some of it is, you know, is us. It's reader response, uh, and he wanted it that way. That's why he, I believe, that's why he um, he made his lyrics intentionally multivalent. Uh, a good example, um, Harry Friedman. Uh, it's another good book, and by the way, I I can't look, wait to read uh, Rags of Light, Leonard Cohen and the Landscape of Biblical Imagination, because when we talk about rhetoric, that's a partly an imagination kind of a thing as well. Uh, you build. But um, this is another book, a fine book, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, The Mystical Roots of Genius, Harry Friedman. And um, I found it interesting using this book in my research because sometimes Friedman would point out the rabbinic or the Kabbalistic sources for Cohen. And I would be thinking about a New Testament source um, that seemed obvious. So uh, for instance, in the, in the, the song, Show Me the Place, uh, Cohen has these lyrics, show me the place, help me roll away the stone, show me the place I can't move this thing alone, show me the place where the word became a man. Now, from my background, 
I mean, all I'm hearing is John 1, I'm hearing Easter morning, I'm hearing, you know, all kinds of things like that from my background. And Friedman reads that, and he's and he hear <clears throat> he hears Jacob at the well in Genesis. And that's what he thinks that's referring to. And it is probably, but Cohen being Cohen, I think it's probably referring to both. And so it was interesting when I was when I was researching using this book as amongst others. I kept thinking, yeah, um, I relied on it for the kind of rabbinic and Kabbalistic sources that I know far less well. But I think it's also important to add the other ones that Cohen certainly was aware of. Um, even though he was not Christian, he certainly knew Christendom and he knew the the uh, Christian scriptures and even the, the <clears throat> patristic writings and, and early Christian legends and hagiographies and stuff. He knew all of that. And so when you mentioned in the presentation mm -hmm. that like, Leonard is like more Christian than Paul is. This is kind of what you're referring to, like all of this kind of ingrained things that Leonard Cohen was aware of, but also this kind of heavy socialization into these texts and ideas in our culture as well, right? Like they just kind of come through sometimes. And like, yeah, yeah. He was, a, he's a, he inherited the the Christian, the, the introspective conscience of the West that Christopher Stendhal talked about that. I mean, Cohen inherited that. Mm -hmm. One of the surprises for Paul scholars is that you'll hear Paul say something like, uh, you know, um, he, Paul wasn't worried about his salvation, particularly. I mean, he says at one point something about it, but he, he says, "I, you know, I'm, I'm perfect according to the, the things I've, I've done great. He was had a clear conscience. He wasn't a, a Cartesian, you know, a kind of, he hadn't learned to kind of go deep in that way. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's another question. Yeah. Brian, you want to jump in? Um, just a, a question of, of interpretation um uh friedman uh reading as 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 a jewish scholar and as uh, also as an historian of jewish mysticism uh is really helpful by unpacking that but then sometimes uh it can blind him right uh so in in the interpretation show me the place you know the word became a man i mean <laughs> uh that that there's no jacob uh, allusion there uh the, the 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 illusion is very clear and 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 that's just we all interpret you know from from our place of course so that's that's, that's there's nothing surprising about that um and i had a second thought but i've lost it now <laughs> i i did have a follow up while you're thinking about that i'll just say that i think Cohen, Cohen would be happy that it, that it could be interpreted two ways at once. I, from everything that you see in his lyrics, that's what he was going for. As many yeah, possible yeah. visions. And certainly God yeah. and sex, by the way. I mean, this was, we didn't even talk about that, but the idea of sort of sex and God, he even at one point in his poetry writes sex, S underline X. Um, like my Jewish students at Concordia often write God, that's how he... So he he was you know and and it wasn't facile either for him he was pointing to the sort of the depth of the physical experience of desire of longing lift the longing mm -hmm. up sorry somebody may I, ask, may I ask a question yeah go ahead Hazard. uh when you read Paul especially in Greek what kind of poet was he and what kind of stylist was he in his writing especially parts like. First Corinthians thirteen or some poetic parts of his writing. Did Leonard Cohen shed any light on the way you read stylistically, Paul? The way you see, the way you understand. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I um, this was one of the things I tried to do in the book uh, was exactly that um, by putting some texts of Paul's right beside texts of Cohen's without chapter and verse. Um, uh, the other. Um, by putting them right beside each other without sort of distinguishing too much between them, I wanted to point out that there is some poetry uh, in Paul. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, the Cohen aficionados will know, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he reworked and worked and reworked and reworked to death his, his lyrics. And I don't think Paul did that. Um, so, um, so there, you know, Paul was not as poetic as Leonard Cohen, but there are pieces of Paul that are really quite poetic. And I wanted to shine a light on those in the book by doing that. The other thing I, I wanted to do uh, that was a kind of a stylistic choice is that people will notice that I often, I use the word Leonard instead of Cohen. <clears throat> and that, I did that on purpose because it's Paul. And so I wanted Leonard and Paul, not Cohen, 
And then what do you say? The Apostle Paul, well, not everybody thought he was an apostle. St. Paul, this is recept into the reception history. So Leonard and Paul. Um, but thank you. That question points out that Paul <clears throat> could be poetic. He wasn't um, as poetic as Leonard Cohen, but um, but he could be. And uh, and we didn't even talk about the rhetoric, the rhetorical training. But um, I find it interesting that they they both presented, you know, we we don't have unmediated access to the people. They performed um, their personalities, uh, their gender, uh, <clears throat> and everything else. And um, so we're left with that perform the performances to compare in some ways. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks, you. thanks everyone. Thanks, Matthew, for that. Um, I think we're kind of time to wrap up now. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, before we go. So like Matthew uh, mentioned, uh, this book, his book is part of the Advancing Studies in Religion book series with McGill Queen's University Press. I have the privilege of currently being the book series editor. Uh, so there's more books in the series. If ever you want to go and check that out, you can go and see on McGill Queen's University Press's website. Um, and if you have your own book in the oven, if it's cooking and you're there, you're writing your manuscript or you're thinking about it and you think maybe this series is a good fit for it, please do feel free to reach out to me um at any time always happy to chat about it and always happy to see people's manuscripts or books in progress uh, it's the great part of this this role of mine uh also worth mentioning uh for those of you who uh, are involved with the canadian society for the study of religion or who would like to be uh they have their conference this year uh, with congress uh that's going to be in montreal uh in the middle of, during the middle of june at mcgill and so if you're interested, the call for papers has been extended. So if you'd like to present something there or, you know, later on, if you just want to attend the conference, um, you can go and visit the CESSR's website. Uh, so at CESSRSCER.ca and uh, the call for papers there. And so if that's something that interests you, please go and have a look. And the, the deadline for um, session and paper submissions is the 30th of January. So we've still got a, a few days there. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you, Matthew, thanks for coming. And I'll uh, see you all in the next webinar. Bye, thank everyone. you, Sarah. Thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. <laughs>